Um, you are Brit that you were talking about. Um, we all know that. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, here again, back in Norway. Um, as far north as we've all ever been. Um, next year's North Pole, I believe. Um, so, you know, keep hold of those woolly hats. Um, okay, so uh, this this basically was, was born out of me not having a presentation to do one year and I didn't have time to do it, so I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. I get really tired of people not being able to ask questions, uh, either because they don't have any, they can't think of any, they don't, they don't want to raise their hand or whatever, so let's relax a bit at the end of the day and ask all the questions we all meant to ask uh, and see how things go. So what we're going to do first is we're going to introduce our panel. Um, it's already been done on, on, the, on the screen, which I didn't know because I didn't know any of this was happening. So thanks, Richard. Um, but just, just to introduce yourselves. So um, start with, with ladies first. Oh, it does work. Wonderful. Um, I'm Tony Purvis. I am a member of the CT and I work for Amblin Partners for International Distribution and Operations. Hello, I'm Kevin Markwick. I own a cinema in England, the Picture House Cinema in Outfield. Nothing to do with them. They stole my name. We've been there 110 years. Um, not me, personally, obviously. Um, and I'm also a member of the CTC. At least I think I am. Yeah, I'm going to say yeah. Uh, I'm Jerry Pierce. I'm not a member of CTC, whatever the heck that is. I have you no don't clue whatsoever. Uh, so I'm from California and uh, have been involved with this adventure of making and distributing movies for quite a while now. Excellent, excellent. So that's how a that's how pop crew, our pop team. Um, um, completely, no, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cinema technology community, I believe. Ah, okay, good. Um, so anyway, one of the first questions that we're going to all ask is uh, event cinema. Is it cinema, you know, at the risk of sounding like Martin Scorsese, is it cinema? Who wants to start? Me, I love event cinema. Yeah, but is it cinema? Yeah, I think it is. Why is it? Because it's in a cinema. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we could play Formula Pink One. Pick the bones out cinema? of that. <laughs> we could play Formula One or boxing, and is, is that cinema? Uh, I believe it's a valuable addition to the cinema. Um, we punch slightly above our weight. We're 25% uh, of my ticket sales are for event cinema. Totally, I realise that's quite um, high. Uh, nationally, in the UK, I think they run at about 3%, maybe 4%. But um, So, yeah, I happen to think it's an important part of cinema. But, you know, you could say, well, <sighs> Avengers is a certain type of cinema and uh, Roy Anderson is a completely different type of cinema, isn't it? It depends on how you're defining cinema. He said trying to wriggle off the hook. Roy. Well, film director, they're completely different types of films. Oh, no, really. uh, well, <laughs> he's Swedish. <laughs> um, Oops. Does anybody else have a thought about this? Um, I think that... Um... If, if we're going to go in, in, into our minds and think about this on a bigger scale, I think films are and cinema is a way of uh, expressing a story. Um, it's taking you from a beginning to an end through a, a series of you know wonderful meetings and whatnot. And I think event cinema is exactly the same. It's telling the story. It's in a cinematic environment, and it's making it more accessible for those that can't perhaps make it to a theatre in the central cities or can't afford it because often, you know, if you want to go and see the uh, Philharmonica, you're going to be paying, you know, maybe 40 bucks. And if you go to the cinema, it might be 20. So it's actually allowing for storytelling on a, a mass scale. How eloquent was that? <laughs> and actually, that, that is the origins of cinema, isn't it? Is, is uh, entertainment brought to the masses at a, at a reasonable price. That's where it all started, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No feeling on this one or the other. Yeah. It makes money for the cinema owners, so it's cinema. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm for it. Yeah. Who's a guinea? <laughs> Nobody a guinea. No. See, motion passed. We all good. We all good. We we believe it's it's here to stay and here forever. Uh, it's absolutely here how, to stay. How, how can it get better then? Uh, well, they can get better from a technical perspective, I would suggest. 
Yeah. I think we need to answer yeah. the question. Yes. Ooh. Yeah, let's see what you did there. <laughs> um, because the, uh, the, the the technical standards are a little lax, I think. You know, we're using a different colour space, aren't we, on event cinema than we are in, in on our projectors. So the picture's not as good as it could possibly be. But I think that will come in time eventually, hopefully, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the sound can be a bit erratic. They're not very good at... Uh, Sometimes at uh, giving you a, a, a consistent sound level. Maybe we can create a switch. On, yeah, on the, on the, a filmmaker button. On the projector or on the um, on the server, like I heard about the yeah the new server that Dolby were doing. Ah. So I don't think I don't think it's necessarily the technology. I think it's how to market it and how to get the information and uh, let people know it's happening. I think one of the big things about movies and the mainstream. Is, is their ability of convincing people two weeks that they've never heard of a movie to two weeks later to spend their money to, to see it. And I don't think we've done and have a good methodology of getting that information for the event. I think the technology will follow if we can get the other parts, but at the moment, how do you let people know it's going to happen? Uh, well, like I say, we're 25% of our, of our ticket sales are event cinema. I think in the UK, it's a pretty mature market, isn't it, event cinema? Mm -hmm. I think people are quite well aware of it. If you look at, well, they've now grossed five million now with Fleabag in the UK. Well, this is extraordinary. You know, mm -hmm. That's absolutely extraordinary numbers. Uh, and this, uh, we put um, the Les Miserables, the concert version, on sale on Sunday night, and it's already had to move to a second screen. You know, we've already added a second screen. And where are we now? Tuesday, Monday. What day is this? Monday. Monday. So I think in the UK, the, the the word is definitely. You know, I think it's a fairly mature market. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we've um, I think we've covered event cinema. I think we we, we all like event cinema. Uh, I do agree that the technologically it should be should be a little better. But I think that's more from a production standpoint rather than from a, a cinema standpoint. Uh, would you agree with that? We do what we can. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we lined out a lot of the um, distribution side, you know, with um, with satellite or internet, um, with buffering and things like that. So I think I think it's in a, a much better place now than it's been than it's ever been. Yeah, if it just went and killed the person that invented HDCP, we'd all be better off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Burn down their house <laughs> and all their children. Yeah, yeah. I don't like that person. <laughs> we get that impression. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to sort of hopefully delve into a little bit what Oliver was touching on earlier on, my such a little presentation on, um, which is the disconnect, in, in our opinion, disconnect between filmmakers um, creatively on what technology is available, you know, who's driving who, uh, particularly when it comes to things like HFR. Um, you know, do we create the technology and help filmmakers use it? Um, or do the filmmakers want to invent this technology and use this technology and the cinemas have to effectively jump to it? Um, what's, what's your opinion, Jerry, on that? Well, it, it was an interesting discussion. Oliver brought up some, some nice points. Let me could focus on the HDR at the moment, or excuse me, high frame rate at the moment. Um, the, how many people saw... Gemini Man in 2D24. There's one. Well, see, this is, they had a really bad box office. So this is the reason no one saw it. But did you, the question I would have back to you is, did the 2D24 look like a standard movie? If I'm honest, no. It looked very flat, I found. Yeah, and I think that, I think we were looking at, in that particular one, sorry, I've got to get on a rant against Oliver, is that I don't think it was the high frame rate, it was the way he made the movie that changed how it looked and how it didn't pull it off to me as a, as a good film, mm -hmm. in addition to the acting and all the other parts that I found. Yeah, I mean, I watched it in both. I watched it in 60 frames 3D and 24 frames 2D uh, because I felt like I would be asked this question one day. Um, <laughs> See, there I am. Yeah, it's, it's I felt, with it. felt obliged in my position to do so. Um, so I watched it in both, and I watched it in high frame rate first, uh, and then I watched it standard. And I found the high frame rate um, pretty much immediately to be almost unwatchable. I couldn't, I was constantly bored out of the movie story because I was just looking at what was going on on that train and, and everything else. But and the water just, looked really cool, didn't it? Uh, I don't know about 
cool. But it looked, yeah, it, looked it, 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 it just looked odd. It had an oddity to it that I don't think guests understood what they were watching and they think they thought that it was something wrong. Um, so, and then, but then I watched it in 24 frames and the film didn't improve, if I'm honest. Um, but, but that's, that's, but, but that's ultimately the answer that we always come up with at these things when we go around with this question is that a good film is a good film, a bad film is a bad film. It doesn't matter whether it's in 3D, 2D, smell a vision, feel around. You know, feel around, feel around. <laughs> yeah, I got I, I got in trouble for inventing that one. <laughs> I'm not going to do feel around again. No, 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 no. Um, and um, you know, ultimately, a, a good film's a good film, isn't it? And a bad film's a bad film. Don't matter what you do to it. And I can't honestly say we didn't get a single inquiry. Are you are you sure you're getting that strange new thing? Yeah, no, neither did we. I mean, but I mean, Ang Lee isn't like a, a poor filmmaker. He's a renowned, mm. you know, quality he's filmmaker. Up his technology. Yeah, but is is that the issue though? Is he's just he's got? Yeah, I think you take a look at someone like Cameron, who has been looking at, at new technologies and what he likes for his storytelling, and he's going to he's really spent two or three years figuring out how he can use the the, the his palette of things that to make movies to make the best movie possible and tell the story he wants to. So your to your original point is are we driven by filmmakers? Well we're driven by equipment and manufacturers that influence filmmakers to try out new things and then they try and shove it down on us and if it works and sticks, we do more of it. If it doesn't work, well that was one movie for them and then they move on. So I think it, it is driven New technologies and new introductions come from the creatives to us. I don't think we generally go to them and say, hey, we've got something brand new, try it. But they do, and then we experiment and find out what works. Did, um, did filmmakers invent 4DX? I'm curious, I don't know. No. You know, Tony? I do not know, but I know that it shouldn't exist. <laughs> In my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. Podcast in 4DX. <laughs> I don't think we'll last. No. Too many health and safety risks. Yeah. I'm not available for that one. No, no. Um, I mean, my knee jerk reaction uh, when I first saw it was, you know, because I didn't just see it as a guest, I also had the, the fun of making sure we did all the testing um, to make sure that we, you know, we got the print in, we did it, we tested again. There was some issues around the testing um, because the test footage that came out didn't have a watermark on it and then when obviously when the film came out there was a watermark on it which was like oh well this isn't the same version and there was some flickering and all sorts and then we had to disable the watermarking or change it from one more watermarking to another and it was a it was a bit of a miver frankly and from an exhibitor perspective i was like what what benefit is this to anyone when nobody really likes it you know, apart from Julian, and um, I mean, I'm not. You know, I'm just tell me which cinema Julian goes to, and I'll sort that one out for here for Julian, and and everyone else can just be, be save all the money. Yeah. Um, and my immediate reaction was, we need to stop these filmmakers from doing these stupid decisions because it's just making all of our lives a nightmare. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I don't mind making my life a nightmare if it's for the better. But this just the perception of this just doesn't seem to be for the better. It seems to be because we want to please a filmmaker because he can do it rather than he should. Mm. But would it ever, would, would it ever become the norm if, he, if filmmakers persevere with this kind of thing? I can't, I can't see it personally, but I'm old and warty. So I just don't want to miss something that's coming. And I'm, yeah. I'm willing to let them sure. play with some of these. And, and at some point in time, they're going to hit something which, which works. And so let's not miss an opportunity that we may not see at some point in time. High frame rate? I don't know. I'm going to wait. I, honestly, I haven't seen a filmmaker do it right yet. I think I'm going to see Avatar do it right, and I think I'm not going to notice at all. It's just going to, I'm going to like the movie. Or not like it, but not Oops. because of high frame rate. Are we all going to still be alive when Avatar comes out? Though? That's the question. <laughs> I will be. Oh, right. <laughs> 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 so, 
sorry, I had to get the old joke in there. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, anybody want to comment on HFR now that we've um, dug it up again? Anybody? Oh, Julian, there's a surprise. Yeah. Come on, Julian. Throw the cube. Can we have a, Throw the have... cube. Throw it really hard. <laughs> Throw it hard. <laughs> Come on, Julian, give us your two cents. I okay. think if we like um, brighter pictures and higher dynamic range, then we probably will need HFR. And don't forget, this is a greater palette. It doesn't mean filmmakers need to use it. So um, I think HFR is something that will, like Jerry said, need to be played with, and at some point it will, it will, be, it will, it will work. Mm -hmm. And um, what's really exciting in my view is that when you shoot at 120 frames per second, apart from the noise challenge, you can then use some really clever uh, spatial, or temporal rather, temporal filtering to get a lower frame rate. So you can in post put in the temporal blur uh, the motion blur, as we call it, um, as you wish, so it's not baked into the actual original shoot. So um, I just think this is you know, this is Angley experimenting. He's looking at new languages, new aspects of the language of cinema, and some people like it, some people don't. Uh, I don't think it's HFR that we should scorn because of two movies that have, or three that have attempted it. So I, I think there's a uh, Patrick has a question. So you can throw the cube at Patrick. Cube Patrick. Um, I think there's a, a, a difference between are you d displaying in 3DR and how you do production. It's just like 4K or 8K. 8K, you probably want to do production if you can in very higher, but what you distribute doesn't have to match what you make it. And so I, I totally agree that I think the 120 is probably a great filmmaker tool that may never make it out into the real world. In terms of um, high dynamic range or brighter pictures, um, I'm not, there's, I could have a, have a nice argument with you uh, in skin tones on a 30-foot uh, Lambert presentation, do they really need to jump from the current 4-foot Lamberts up to 8-foot Lamberts? Or shouldn't they stay down? I think in a darkened environment, they probably stay down. And I'm not sure that if you give a, a headroom up to, you know, 100-foot Lamberts, you need to have a high frame rate for the spikes that are going along. But that's a different question. Patrick. Let me throw a question back at you, which is, does it matter what any of us in here think? Because the Cinity systems that were deployed to show Gemini Man in 3D, 4K, 120 frames per second were not deployed in Norway or Europe or North America. They were all deployed in China in double digits. That's where this is aimed at. And we should be asking, what do the Chinese markets think? What do the emerging markets think? Because we don't set the agenda anymore. They do we know what the Chinese market thought of the picture? They paid 25 euros um, per ticket to see it in that format, and they had over 80% occupancy rate. Well, there you go. For Gemini, then? Yes. <laughs> it takes the wind out of our sails, then, doesn't it? <laughs> Is that uh, maybe new technology over substance, then? Because it was pretty awful in terms of... From what story. I read in Chinese media, part of the reason was national pride. We're showing it in a way that you can't see it in North America. Ha, ha, ha. Fair. Yeah, okay. We'll give them that. Well, that's not sustainable, no, no, that's, that's not a sustainable idea, is it? Tell the Chinese that. Okay. So how come it wasn't, how come it wasn't released in 120 frames in 2D? Anyone? Julian? No uh, we pushed them. We pushed Paramount on this. I think it's their... Concern. Well, I don't know if Ang really believed in that. He really thought that the 3D needed to be the high frame rate. Uh, but I think the second one is that studios don't like making multiple multiple masters, mm -hmm. and so this was a restriction so that they didn't um, double the number of normal releases. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. But you could have cheated the system by taking your 3D and only playing one eye back. I, I, you shouldn't do that, but you. Yeah. <laughs> just or you could just poke everyone in the eye on the way in. <laughs> <laughs> just stand there. <laughs> yeah, feel around. Feel around. Feel around. <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump on to another one of um, all of those things as well. Um, it's like you read our minds. But. I hear a lot about um, 
Cinema needs to keep up with television. Um, you know, we need to make sure that you know we can do high dynamic range and we can do 4K or 8K or billion K or whatever the hell K we do. Um, is it fair to compare domestic TV and HDR with cinema? And are we really lagging like, behind TV? Uh, particularly when you know there's a lot of TVs out there that claim HDR and you know it's HDR 10, it's HDR 10 plus, it's Dolby Vision. Do we really know the difference unless you're really into it? Um, you know, are we really comparing apples and apples here? No. Um, the cinema is a completely different environment. Um, if you want to watch something at home on your swanky TV with high dynamic range, then go ahead. But you're still not going to have the same experience as you do at the cinema, even if it is technically just 24 frames per second, 2K. You go to the cinema for the experience. You don't just go for the technological uh, appearance or, or the sound. You, well, sounds great. But um, you go to watch it with other people, depending on your favourite kind of film. You know, I remember my favourite films are horror films. I love going to the cinema to enjoy that with other people that are going to jump at the same places. They're going to laugh awkwardly, you know, and if you just look around at a bit where you know there's about to be a jump and watch other people's reactions, for me, that is so much better than watching it with one other person in my house or, you know, a couple of friends. I would rather be in a whole room with people that are jumping out of their skin, and I don't care if it's high dynamic, dynamic range, as long as there's a decent enough picture on that screen, as long as it sounds good to me, and... Five one's fine, guys. Five one is fine. It's the environment. It's the emotions that you get from being in that room, which you cannot compare with being at home, regardless of the technology. Okay. Next question. That yeah. was great. That was, that was a great answer. <laughs> and also, it's not just about the cinema, is it? Going out to the cinema, you're going out, might have a meal, you might go and have a drink. It's all part of the experience. But no meal in the screening room, please. No, 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 no hot food. <laughs> we'll get into that. No hot food. Um, I was going to say something else about that. I've forgotten already. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, because it's ultimately what these things mostly have to surely be, or in large part, they are, are exercises in selling more tellies in shops. They're not really about... Which I get. I yeah. absolutely get yeah. that. But I do hear a lot of the conventions, a lot of the trade shows, a lot of, you know, all cinema is lagging behind. And it's a, are we an easy target? Because we're not high, generally not high dynamic range, you know, we're not generally 4K. No, but it's how we educate the customer, I suppose, which sounds very high for mm. you know, you know, because actually a well set up 2K 7.1 presentation will blow any very expensive television out of the water. But how do you get that message across without just doing it? We're selling movies, mm -hmm. we're selling stories. We're not selling TVs, mm -hmm. so I don't want them to know what projector I have in the back or what the sound system is. I want them to come in to experience the movie. And so uh, there are some companies that want to attach their name to the presentation so they can sell consumer TVs because you saw it in the theater. I don't necessarily want to support them. I want to sell the movie. I want to sell the experience. Mm -hmm. So is it is it absolutely fine to just be 5.1, 14 foot lambdas, 2K, um, and everything else is just noise? Uh, we have to stay with good presentations. And, and we do are at risk of having presentations not as good as they need to be. But an affordable 5.1, 14 foot Lambert in a nice environment with recliners, and recliners pay for themselves very quickly. Mm -hmm. And, and beer that you serve outside, not during the presentation. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Um, is, is, is what we're, we're selling. Yeah. And people don't just complain about um, the technology, if it's good or bad. They, they, if it's too hot or it's too cold or if it's messy or if it's too, yeah, whatever. They're not, they're not actually saying, I do believe your 2K was slightly not mined up properly. You know, they're, um, <laughs> why they say it in that accent, I, I have no idea. <laughs> it's very annoying. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a, it, it, like any, I mean, we have a very large, we have a big restaurant attached to the cinema. And the thing about a restaurant is, is there are a thousand things that can go wrong. 
with your with your meal, with the evening. And it's kind of the same in the cinema. There's a lot of things that go wrong other than the technology that spoil people's experience. So maybe we focus a little too much on, on, on that sometimes. I mean, cinema is much better for, for, to, to, to operate because you herd everyone into a dark room. They all sit facing the wall and you turn the lights out for two hours. It's brilliant. Obviously, in a restaurant, the buggers keep asking you for things, which is annoying, but there you go. So, I, I do have to notice, so, so what sells in the auditorium? Well, look at this. We have filled every recliner in the back row, <laughs> and we filled most of the front row, which normally you don't fill. But, but because it's a recliner, that's where they go to sit. That's what we need to do in the cinema. We need to get people in there. I can uh, speak from experience that everybody on that back row Tomorrow morning, we'll be reclined and asleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what happened last year. So I mean, I'm curious. I mean, I'm genuinely curious. Where does that... Um, so my theatres have got small capacities, like 110 seats, 75 seats, and 99 seats. How am I, how am I going to get all those recliners in? I'm just not going to do that, am I? I mean, really, it's a... It's a it, 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 it sort of well, disadvantages... You ran your, your theatre. Yeah. No, no, well, we do, we do, but I'm just saying, it disadvantages uh, smaller theatres a bit. Isn't it? I'm just throwing, yeah, no, I did, I did. I'm, I'm throwing it out there, that's all. It's not a, not a serious question, but it's quite tricky for me to decide to do that. Because, you know, I'll put these great big buggers in, I'm going to get, like, four seats. If people are prepared to sit in the seats you already have, then... Can you stack them up? Could you just sit on this gentleman's lap, please? No, it's not going to work. Is, is that a stupid your, idea? Sorry, everyone. Is that part of your feel around? Cinema? Feel around. We're really promoting this, are we? Fully immersive, madam. Maybe when you Ang Lee bought into this feel around cinema. It's going downhill. Yeah. yeah. You know, he's almost out of beer. He yeah. Needs another one. I need more beer. We need more beer. Who's, who's in charge of beer? Richard, yeah. you're in charge of beer. You're in charge of beer. We need more. We need more beer. Uh, the other thing, um, you know, we were talking about immersive sound earlier on. Um, I know some people, I know one particular person who's not here, absolutely loathes immersive sound, as in, you know, 3D object-based sound. You know, he's huge 5 and 7.1 advocate, thinks Dolby Atmos is awful, you know, should never have been invented. Yeah. Is he like mono? No. <laughs> no, but he's a reasonably technical guy and he just doesn't like immersive sound. Um, and, you know, I'm just curious as to, you know, should we put immersive sound in every auditorium? You know, will that resolve the chicken and egg scenario? If, you know, every film can then be, can be made in, um, in immersive sound and mixed in immersive sound. Do we, do we really want that? Um, is is that what we what the ultimate goal should be? Um, Are you, you know, paying? That's the thing. Yeah. Well, it's free. Yeah. <laughs> if it's free, yeah. Well, exactly. I mean, it, as a you know technical person in a, in a cinema chain, you know, I I struggle to get the funding to do one auditorium in immersive sound. Never mind all ten. Um, so it's it's a real particularly when you know it's all about the movie, the experience, the seats. It's not necessarily about the technology. Um, so it's a really difficult sell because there's, there's a few mixed messages. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I suppose the question is, you know, you. Are, the, are the immersive sound tracks worth it? You know, is, is everything that we listen to in an immersive sound world going to be worth it? I think that you also need to look at it from a uh, creative standpoint and a post-production standpoint. Um, because obviously it's a whole new mix, which also depends on your delivery timelines as well. So a lot of, and I, I will go out there and say, a lot of the directors that we've worked with don't particularly want to create an object-based audio track. They want a 5171, and that will do. And when we have had an Atmos track available for international territories, a lot of people haven't taken it because then they have to create their dub, which is expensive. And... It's another thing to think about, it's another thing to pay for. Um, so I'm not sure that we should be looking to put object, although maybe, maybe it's the whole chicken and egg thing, right? So if we did install everywhere, then maybe directors would be more inclined to create this, this Atmos track or, or whatever. Um, but I just don't think so at the moment. I mean, 
it, it takes a lot of pushing uh, filmmakers and production companies to actually even get these created in the first place. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember, you know, Dunkirk, I think, wasn't in Atmos. And we all knew Dunkirk was going to probably play in every PLF room in the land. Um, and I don't think Spectre was either. I think even The Force Awakens was a last minute thing. Um, so not every big film is going to be mixed in, in immersive sound, and I'm just curious as to the reason why that is. No, and economically, if recliners really are the thing, what am I going to spend my money on? Recliners or immersive audio? What's going to make me more money? Recliners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think, I, I can't imagine someone being against uh, immersive audio. No. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. And Christopher Nolan's not the many. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm saying in our group, in terms of creative, oh yes. I can see how creatives would be against it or for it. But in terms of you can use it or not in an installation, it's up to you. Um, but And I think that if a creative has decided to use immersive audio, there's a whole bunch of issues. Is it loud enough that you can actually hear it? But that's a separate issue entirely. I think it should be done because it's a filmmaker choice. And so I think it should be. I think most of the majors are doing the immersive audio mix first and then creating trim passes for the 5.1 and 7.1. But some of them are just going to the this 5.1 only. They, you don't need a 7.1. But, but there's no... I, I think this is a, a full option uh, for a theater owner. It's a question of cost. And I totally agree that I think your, your priority number one is... is recliner seats, that's where the ROI is. There's in the 7-1 or a, an immersive audio mix for your PLFs, you want to, I, I love it when AMC puts little LED lights on every speaker so they can have, go and look, see all the speakers you're going to get. And it's, a, do it's a business that I want to get into of selling cardboard boxes with Velcro on them filled with helium that I can put up there with an LED light on it and sell the theater as immersive and no one will know the difference. Ooh. That's for you, Jillian. <laughs> yeah, they don't put them lights in the speakers anymore. Uh, we'll stop doing that. Yeah. They should flash. That's what they should do. Like disco. That's a bad idea, clearly, from the look of the face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about, you know, what about, what about the audience? Do, do you, I mean, hand, as a show of hands, do you prefer... Atmos or immersive sound mixes um, compared to standard. Yeah. So reasonably, reasonably quite a lot then. I mean, I suppose it's a kind of loaded question in a way. Do you prefer recliners over immersive sound? <laughs> <laughs> Cautious, I'm yes. Up, I'm just blocking the line. <laughs> Both. 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 Ah. Both. A lot of so people. So it's about creating the entire experience and maxing out the experience rather than one or the other. Is that what you mean, Julian? <laughs> okay, superb. And um, what about if you were, you know, we always use this analogy of going, you get at a crossroads and you can either go right to one cinema or left to another cinema. And do you particularly seek out uh, a cinema with high dynamic range, maybe a, a, a Dolby cinema if you've got one near you, which um, or, or even if you know that those projectors that they're, that they're using might be, you know, higher dynamic range. Um, you go for the title and how far it is from you. Location. Most definitely people choose on location, I would suggest. And time. I think it entirely depends on the type of the evening. So uh, I go to cinema in the evening, largely. Um, if I'm just going by myself and just want to quick to a flick, I might just pop to my local cinema, which is completely standard. Uh, if I want, really want to see something, and I've been waiting six months to see this, I'm probably going to pay extra money, I'm going to make the extra journey, and I'm going to go and see it in the Dolby Cinema. Mm -hmm. and time, uh, uh, as you say, time. That's actually when we did a very unscientific experiment with 3D, um, to see whether people really did actually really want it. And one of the things we, we discovered, I did it, I did 2D, 3D at the same time, 2D, 3D at different times, all variations. And the thing that trumped everything was what time is it on? If it was on at the time they want, they went, oh, I suppose we'll sit in the 3D. But that basically trumps everything. Location, time, two things. 
Trump. <laughs> Sorry about <laughs> That's a Trump. Okay. Any questions? Trump, if you don't use Trump, I won't use Boris. Oh. Um, <laughs> Brexit. That's been uh, refreshingly absent all day, actually. It wasn't till then. Yeah, sorry, everyone. <laughs> it's not my fault. I voted yeah, to stay. I voted to stay. Any questions on any of those topics um, that, you, that you're burning? I you know. With, with, when you had a beer, your inhibitions are down. Where can I buy feel around? <laughs> <laughs> Is yeah. that what you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Very wrong. Okay, so we're on we're on last orders now. Uh, we're on the home straight, and we're going to have a little bit of a change because I know I'm going to like blue touch paper in this one, particularly with Kevin. Um, oh. And hot food. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Should we have, or is it okay to bring hot food into an auditorium? And I'm talking things like pizzas and burgers and other things like that. I mean, is is that as a show of hands? Would you would you like that? Patrick. Patrick, <laughs> Patrick you I had it for five years in Singapore. It's wonderful. Yeah. Was there a, was there a limit to what you could have on the toppings? There's no limit to what I can eat. <laughs> no, but that might be like, no, you can have cheese, three cheese only, or or was it like you can have jalapenos? You can have. I had push buttons on this. People appeared when I pressed the button. Really? Magic. Did, Did that they... not annoy you? Only when the bill came. <laughs> did um, did they walk in front of the projector as well and disrupt everyone else's viewing? No, no, they were very ninja. <laughs> mm, okay. And how about the people also eating around you? Did they eat with their mouths closed and therefore didn't upset everyone else in the room? Or? This was loungers. We were spaced out. I didn't have to sit next to anybody. Okay, so maybe the question like, should have been, in a standard cinema, do we allow hot food? The answer is no. We allow popcorn. Popcorn's noisy. Noxious, yeah. I, 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 I won't, wouldn't personally go to a dining th cinema, mm -hmm. so uh, that's my choice mm -hmm. as, a, as a consumer, but I think there are a lot of people that want to have that. Now, generally, the image looks like shit, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's some of these LED screens that if someone wants to come out where they get it brighter and you can get the darks, so you don't have the reflection off of it, well, I can still make a good presentation. I personally wouldn't go to it, and I wouldn't encourage my children to go to it. But it's an option. Why is the is the image not so good? Because they've got lights up, so the ninjas don't trip over. Yeah. They're rubbish ninjas, aren't they? Don't yeah. trip over. Another little side note on the popcorn thing. That shouldn't be allowed either, in my I humble agree. opinion. Oh, well, um, I would go to the theatre without popcorn. No, quick. Yeah, quick. Uh, keep that for your home. Keep that for your home cinema. cinema. Do you not think that also uh, people's manners go out of the window with popcorn? Like, you, when you're eating a normal meal, you eat very, very nicely. But with popcorn, you just go... That's and because it's you can't everywhere. see. Well, I don't think you need to be able to see. You to You've got fingers stuff. and de dexterity. Stuff. No, it's not acceptable. It's Absolutely unacceptable. Thing. We know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to make a little short film that we could put on before the feature that says, Popcorn in your mouth. Strangers that should be friends. Because <laughs> it is a nightmare to clean up after. You know, you've got a Harry Potter show. It's like a popcorn bomb's gone off. And it is... It is a nightmare, but what do you do? Because we make a lot of money on a popcorn, you know, it's like that. Pick a mix. Oh! oh. Uh, Sorry, say I, I thought pick a mix, mix and, yeah. So I'm, I'm genuinely curious about this because I can't believe anyone would want pop, not want popcorn in the cinema, but there's a show of hands. Tony doesn't. Who would go to a cinema if they didn't show, or it didn't show, didn't serve popcorn? Oh, look at that. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Bring your own. I'm amazed. Yeah. There's a new market here. Yeah. <laughs> popcorn free cinema. So, Patrick, you want pizza, but not popcorn. But my, my, the question is, who wants to run? Throw the cube. <laughs> Hit it. Hit it. Ooh. 
the real question is, who wants to have a cinema without popcorn? And, you know, how are you ever going to make money to have a cinema without popcorn? Well, you sell pizzas, clearly. Show hands. Anyone no. in here wants to run a cinema and pay for it without popcorn? Right, no one. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's insane. I don't get it. <laughs> okay, well, one exception. Uh, that's not a cinema. That's not a cinema. So, so Patrick, <laughs> genuinely. <laughs> genuinely. <laughs> oh, throw Patrick. Throw it, Patrick. This is better than rugby. So, seriously, you Your would... question was, would I go to a cinema yeah, that, that doesn't yeah. serve popcorn? Yeah. Yes, I would, and I do. The BAFTA doesn't serve popcorn. The BFI South Bank doesn't serve popcorn. If it's where the film is shown, I want to see it, I'd go there. Oh. I'd prefer it with popcorn, but I'd still go to a cinema, even if it didn't. Oh, oh see. Okay. That's, That's slightly, slightly different. twisted answer there. But that was your question. <laughs> yeah, it was. My like question was wrong. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could experiment with popcorn-free performances. PFPs. No. <laughs> <laughs> What's worse is nachos, though. Oh, nachos. The sound of eating. Yeah. Yes. And is it, all right, and it, okay, is it the smell or is it the noise? Noise. Smell and noise. But mainly the noise. Yeah. It's the Especially noise for, for a nice, quiet horror film. <laughs> when you don't want to hear people munching, you want to have those silences that have creatively been put there. No, no problem with the munching, it's the, it's the rustling. No, I don't mm. Particularly if it's excessive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would you go to a horror film? I'm sorry. Don't do that. <gasps> scary film. Don't do it. Love a good uh, scary film. Amazing films. Okay, I think we're more or less out of time. So if we have any other questions from anybody, now is the time or forever hold your peace. Or just, you know, call us later yeah. on. Um, How did this idiot get on the panel? Throw a popcorn at it. Urian. Someone throw the cube of, the cube of love. Somehow. Throw the cube of love. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Just, just want to bring you back to the immersive sound. Uh, okay. And, uh, and we did see an example of that this today as well. Uh, the benchmark seems to be gravity, which is a very old immersive sound. Gravity's been around for years. Exactly. Oh, you don't mean actual gravity in the film. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, gravity yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Ooh. So obviously that was brilliant. Uh, yeah. And the immersive sound was brilliant. But why, I mean, isn't it a problem that we keep referring to gravity still? After you know all these years with sure. immersive sound, yeah, and surely there are more modern examples. Yeah, but are or they, are they not? I don't think so. I haven't, I haven't no. witnessed anything better, and that's a bit of a problem. So it's a creative I'm, problem, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't say it was necessarily better, but I did hear it. Um, Chapter one in the and I thought that was very, very effective. Scary film. Jerry wouldn't have seen that, would you? I was about to use that as an example as well, but um, I also think that maybe that we refer to gravity because it was such a wonderful story and it was done so visually beautifully as well. Um, and it's the whole combination, so it makes it very easy to, to go to and say, look at this wonderful production and look, listen to the audio, it's fantastic. Whereas you had what was that one about Noah's Ark? Noah. Noah. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, that one was after, and that was, uh, it sounded wonderful, but the rest of it, mm. <laughs> no, That's absolutely right, because it was a whole, whole experience, wasn't it? And it was actually one of the few films that was watchable in 3D as well, so there you go. Sorry, Min. That's all right. It's so, time. It's time to end. So thank you very much, everybody. We have 19 seconds left, so we, we, we need a new demo other than gravity is the, is the takeaway from Miriam. So think, keep thinking caps on, go and listen oh. to some. Oh, oh, oh. I can advertise now. 1917, Atmos. Ah. <laughs> Selfless plug there. Yeah. <laughs> working out at the moment. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it.